The Celtic Christians have a place called a thin place. It's that place where heaven and earth kiss and meet. It happens in the land of the living. I don't know about you, but when we were watching the baptisms today, experiencing that, it felt like a thin place, didn't it? It felt like a place where God and us collided, which is what it is. Baptism is where God's Holy Spirit inaugurates us into the life of Christ, and it was an incredible blessing to participate in that. And for all who were baptized into the living and resurrected Savior, I salute thee, and I am so happy for you. The great thing about worship is, is that there's a thin place every time we gather together, and we go to the Word. The Word is the place where heaven and earth meet and when, we, and when that meets, it erupts into something beautiful. I want to invite you, as we journal along in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 1 through 5. The Gospel of John, as you know, is the fourth gospel. It's made up of two movements, the book of signs and the book of glory. And as, uh, as I understand, you've been traveling through the book of glory, made up of Jesus' upper room discourse. Jesus' upper room discourse, as you know, is kind of Jesus' last lecture. It's his last effort to explain to his disciples that he has nurtured, poured his life into for the last three years what they most need to know. Chapter 17 is this now bridge between the upper room discourse and his passion and the cross. It is this part in the structure of the gospel where Jesus' instruction and his teaching is passed forward now to the embodiment of that teaching in his own life, his own life, death, and resurrection. And it is interesting to know that it happens in prayer. Chapter 17 is Jesus' prayer. This is what combines Jesus' teaching and his action, his prayer. This morning we look at just the first few verses. John 17, one through five. Hear the word of the Lord. And behold, after Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had in your presence before the world existed. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In six days, it happens. 870 freshmen are going to arrive on my idyllic, quiet campus, disrupting the pleasures of summer, the season of long light. There is nothing I love more than being a pastor of a people who are gone. (laughs) But they're coming. And they're coming with boxes and stereos and books. And they're coming with hurts and hopes. They're coming with questions. My passion in life is to welcome those students and to invite them into what I like to call the soil of hope. But the soil of hope is not an institution. The soil of hope has everything to do with the beautiful life. My passion, you might even call it an agenda, is for everyone in my community to experience the beautiful life. What we might call, what Jesus might call, eternal life. I love being a dean of a chapel at a college because there is so much life and vitality. There's so much energy that you can trip over it sometimes. I love rooting for the home team. I love the time-honored traditions. I love the life of the mind. I love my faculty. Most of the time, I love my faculty. (laughs) But one of the things that I love about a college is that it's one of these rare places in a frenetic culture that is always being pivoting towards efficiency, is that you have the time and the leisure 
to have a landscape preserved for a young generation to ask the oldest questions of time. A college campus, if it is nothing else, is a business of questions. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to study the world and unlock the keys of creation and to learn more about the mind of the maker? What does it mean to pursue the beautiful life, what we might call eternal life? I'm interested in that question and I want my students to pursue it with wild abandon because if the gospel is anything, if it has any consequence worthy of our time and attention, it is that it has to do with life, the beautiful life, the good life, eternal life. If what we're doing today has any significance, it has to relate to our lives. What the poet of Psalm 27 might call the good life in the land of the living, to behold it, I want to be a place where we pursue life, yet if we are honest, life, well, it can be elusive, can it? Life is like trying to catch air. It's all around us all the time, but it's difficult to hold on to. How is it in a world where there's so much fecundity of life, so much life teeming that it seems to escape us? The moral philosopher Charles Taylor, in his current epoch of a book, The Secular Age, describes our cultural moment as the disenchanted age. The disenchanted age is an age where people have no longer had any confidence that there's anything larger than ourselves to believe in. That we go around circles in the cul-de-sac of our own navel. There's nothing larger for us to wonder in. And without wonder, there can be no worship. That disenchanted age is spreading through the world like a cancer. It flattens us. It takes the light out behind our eyes. And I see that occasionally, even on a college campus where there's so much life teeming, so much energy all around. There is this sense that life is lost. I like this title of a book by a sociologist, Jean Twenge, who writes about today's college students, Generation Me, but it's the subtitle that I love. Why today's young Americans are more confident, entitled, assertive, and more miserable than ever before. They're confident, yet they're anxious. That speaks to this paradoxical age that we live in. Never before in the history of creation have we had a world with so much information, so much knowledge, so much science, and so much technology. The infrastructure, you look around and it is amazing what human creatures have accomplished. The medical centers, the roads, the automobile, the iPad too. It's fantastic. <laughs> How can there be, however, so much depression and so much anxiety and so much delocation, so much suffering in a world with so much invention? We've never had better resources to keep us alive, but struggled more with our general health. We've never had better technology to save hours of your work, yet struggled to find more time for our family. We've never had better apps that give us satellite precision location on our cell phones, yet wander around so lost. We've never had a culture with so much abundance, yet we are plagued by the fear of scarcity. We've never had a culture where we have lived so long, but many of us seem to be dying earlier. I like how the poet T.S. Eliot frames the question and the issue. He writes, where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? The cycles of 20 centuries brings us farther from God and nearer to the dust. The poet asks the question that casts a shadow over our modern life. Where is the life we have lost in living? 
It's the question whispered in the marriage that is struggling to find its intimacy. Where is it? Where is that life? It's whispered by the school teacher wondering where the community spirit left. Who squandered it? Where is that life we had lost in living? It's said by that businessman wondering where the loyalty has gone. Maybe it's whispered by you here this morning and you showed up in your Sunday best, hoping, just hoping, maybe, maybe there might be a word that would point us to life. Where is the life we have lost in living? Eliot's question is one of the oldest questions, and it is that question, I believe, that points us to the beautiful life. There is an answer, my friends, to the life lost in the living. There is a place that we can go, and it is real, and it begins right now. If you want the real life, the good life, the beautiful life, you do not have to wait. And that is the message I want every student coming into my campus next, year to, next week to hear, that it starts now. Life isn't something you wait for. It's something we live into. It's a large, expansive reality. And if we have the courage to find that narrow path into that reality, it will utterly transform us and give us with a spirit of hope that no institution can hold. To answer the question, where is the life we have lost in living, however, we have to practice an old habit. We have to reclaim a, a foundational instinct. At the time of the Reformation, they called this ad fontes. Do you know this word? Say it with me, ad. Fontes. Ad fontes. Ad fontes is a Latin expression that means back to the sources. At the time of the Reformation, the gospel was held in tight by a decaying institution. The word couldn't be translated. Ad fontes was an instinct of the reformers to go back, back to the sources, back to Hebrew and Greek, to unleash the word, push it out of the building so that it can go back into the streets where it belongs. And when the word is put out on the streets, you cannot hold it back, for when the word goes out, it never comes back void. Ad fontes was the way the church renews itself again and again and again. We don't support tradition for tradition's sake. Tradition is meant to be a servant, but not a master. Ad fontes is where we go to get the life back lost in the living. And I believe that's what I hear Jesus praying in John 17. Jesus, after he teaches his disciples, prays the prayer that embodies his teaching. For the messenger is also the message. Jesus is praying to the Father. It's important never to overlook the obvious and exegesis. Jesus prays. This is what Jesus does. This is what Jesus is still doing. Jesus is interceding for his disciples. Jesus is interceding for his church. And Jesus is still interceding. He is right now at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf, which is why nothing ever can separate us from the love of God, ever. Not because of our prayers, but because Jesus takes our prayers and makes them his prayers, which is why we pray in Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus' name, not as a dead traditional statement at the end of a prayer to put a period at the end of the sentence. We say that as a declaration of reality, that Jesus is right now interceding and praying on our behalf, which is exactly what we find Jesus doing in chapter 17, this bridge between the upper room discourse and his passion. Jesus prays. And as we overhear this prayer, we learn that Jesus has authority over all people. Father, the hour has come, he prays. Glorify your son so that the son might glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people. Authority over all people. Jesus' authority, however, is never coercive. Jesus doesn't kick people into the kingdom. He doesn't bully people into belief. Jesus' authority has been entrusted to him by God the Father so that we might find the life lost in the living. Since he has been given authority over all people, to what? To give eternal life to all who have been entrusted to him. Jesus has been given authority in order that we might find the life lost in the living. 
Jesus has been given authority over all creation because he is the source of all creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things, not some things, all things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing has come into being. And what has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines, it shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot ever overcome it, which means that if you are in the dark, there is a light you can turn to. You cannot stop it because the light cannot be held back. The light is the source of all life. And the Gospel of John is clear that Jesus is the life. The message is also the messenger. Jesus is the ad fontes. Jesus is where we go to find the life we have lost in living. Eternal life, he calls it. Eternal life. I have to confess that for me growing up, eternal life wasn't always an attractive thought. I got the idea from a pushy preacher with wild hair, Channel 22, selling me religious goods and services, suggesting that if I give him a lot of money right now, eternal life will be something I'm gonna get later. You know what? That was way back at the Reformation. One of the reasons why we had to push the gospel back into the street, we call that indulgences, that if you buy something, you give us money, we'll make sure you got your insurance card to get out of hell. (laughs) That kind of practice still goes on. But that's not eternal life. I grew up with this idea of a dichotomy between my life and my eternal life. I grew up in a situation, and maybe you have to, maybe not, and you're lucky if you haven't, but this was my story. I grew up in a place where eternal life was what I learned about in church. And then my daily life is what I had to live in every day. The getting up and putting my clothes on and going to school and doing my chores and hanging with my friends and playing ball and my ordinary life, right? And then I go to church and they talked about eternal life and it's supposed to be glorious and it's supposed to be something I I put all my chips into. But eternal life is far away. It's out here somewhere. And it didn't always seem that there was a connection between eternal life and my life. But I lived in my life, and I wanted to find what's that connection between this eternal life that I'm promised and this life. Now, I'm an old school Christian, and I believe in eternal life. There is a kingdom to come. But what strikes me when I listen to Jesus and overhear his prayer is not that he's promising something far, far away but he's promising something right here, right now. When I listen to Jesus, I don't hear a dichotomy between my life and eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I grew up hearing that eternal life was a far away place an eternal place to hope in. But when I hear Jesus, I don't hear that eternal life is about an eternal place. It's not a place at all. It's an eternal person. And that knowledge begins right now. Eternal life isn't something we wait for. Eternal life is something that we live into with a particular kind of knowledge. And it is a knowledge of God. Where is the life we have lost in living? I believe that the answer is it's lost in the lack of knowledge of God. That the more we know who God is, the more we know what God does, the more life we get to have. Life lost in the living has everything to do with the source of life. Ad fontes, back to Christ. All things came into being through him and are for him. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In him all things were created, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Even our lives, even our church. And that happens right now. It's not something that we wait for. Eternal life begins with a particular knowledge of God. The sociologist Craig Gray, uh, Craig Gay, who teaches 
uh, theology at uh, Regent University, wrote a little book called The Way of the Modern World, and he wrote this. He said that the greatest form of temptation today comes in the form of the suggestion that it's possible, indeed normal and expedient, to go about your daily business in life without getting any thought to God at all. In other words, the life we have lost in living isn't sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The greatest temptation to worldliness today comes in the form of the suggestion that we don't have to think about God. That we can wake up and go to work and do our business and come home and we don't have to let God inter inter interrupt that. But the truth of the matter is, is that the word interrupts and disrupts. It shatters our perceived realities. The word unlocks us from the citadel of the self and pushes us out of the presumed worlds in which most of us are trapped and so desperately want to leave. The word is light that shines in the darkness and pushes us out of death and into new life, the life of baptism, where we are invited to explore the expansive geography of the soil of hope, what Jesus calls eternal life. And if we find that narrow path in that expansive country, it leads farther up and further into the high country of the Trinity, where the kingdom has a gravity that pulls all things towards the king who holds all things together. And that begins right now. It's not something you have to wait for. And when you have that eternal life, it gives us a new vision. It casts out fear. You don't have to be afraid anymore. I love it on... That scripture, do you know this? The opening part of Revelation. John, who's writing this gospel, is overhearing this prayer. And John, because of the testimony of Jesus, is on the island of Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he hears a loud voice behind him like a trumpet say, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and finally to Laodicea. And then he turns and sees that there are seven golden lampstands, seven. And on, in the midst of the lampstands is one like the son of man clothed in a long robe with a golden sash across his chest. His head and hair as white as white wool. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His feet like burnished bronze refined as in a furnace and his voice is like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. In his, in his face, his face is like the sun shining at full force. And when I saw him, John writes, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He's afraid. But he comes and puts his right hand on his shoulder and says, do not be afraid. I am the first, and I am the last, and I am the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. So now write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand, these are the seven angels, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Notice something particular about John's message. John, who would have overheard this prayer, who would have been there in the room at the Upper Root Discourse, he now is a pastor removed from his people on the island of Patmos, but he's injecting and reminding them, ad fontes, go back to the source. If you pay attention to what we just heard from the book of Revelation, there are these seven churches. These churches are the lampstands. And notice what is happening amidst the lampstands. There is one like the Son of Man, clothed in a long robe. In other words, where is Jesus? Jesus is with his church. Even though their pastor is gone, even though you can't see him, John is saying, have faith. Jesus is with you. And everything about his garb, the long robe, the golden sash, the crown on his head suggests that he is a king. And everything about his demeanor, his white hair, his fiery eyes, his feet bronzed in furnace, his face shining at full force, suggests to us that he is somebody we trifle with at our own peril. And to have such a vision concentrates into a great joy, but also a holy fear. And the only proper response is to fall down as though dead. Because this is the source, the ad fontes of all life. This is one of the only physical descriptions we have of Jesus Christ in all of Scripture. And notice what he does. He comes and puts his right hand on our shoulder and says, you do not have to be afraid anymore. My friends, that's the good news. 
That's why eternal life starts right now. It's not a place we wait for. It's a person we worship. And that person comes and speaks to us. You don't have to be afraid in your marriage. You don't have to be afraid at the classroom. You don't have to be afraid as you're packing your boxes to start a new life in college. You don't have to be afraid anymore for if you know Jesus, you know life. And eternal life starts right now. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that your word is our thin place. That we worship not an abstraction, Lord, but we worship you, the eternal person that is even now pouring out your Holy Spirit. For you promised you would never leave us as orphans. That you are here, standing amidst this lampstand, this church. Walk through the aisles, walk through our hearts and our minds, reclaim us as your own, just as the waters of baptism reclaim us, that we are dead and now alive. May your resurrection pro uh, promise fill us with joy, that we might be a people in this place to bear witness to the truth that eternal life starts right now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.